while we wait for everyone to be in place. So first of all, um, I'd like to welcome everybody to this first um, online Zoom seminar for in the linguistics program in the Centre for Research um, Language Diversity seminars. Um, and of course, to welcome our guest speaker today, um, James Walker, who is also our professor and um, just the, the, the right person to be um, introducing this new, um, what should we call it? Um, Mode? Innovation, um, which is to do our seminars in this way. Um, I'd also like to mention that I think this is the first time that we have had a linguistic seminar at La Trobe, which is being attended by someone who is currently in Burma or Myanmar. Vong is, is in <coughs> Yangon right at the moment. And so that's another first. Um, and James is about to talk about the topic, uh, the actual title of which I haven't got in front of me. Apologies, but you can introduce that yourself. Um, James is known to everybody here as a very distinguished sociolinguist, um, an excellent head of department, and someone that we greatly value. I'd like to now suggest that everyone turn off your video and your and mute your sound. This will mean that we have the least amount of potential, what are they called, um, bandwidth errors. And once that's done, James, I think you can start. I also have the ability, I will just mention, as the organiser of this main meeting, to mute anyone that isn't muted. So if you forget to do it, I'll do that. When James finishes, in about, I guess, 40 minutes from now, then, well, whatever, then um, we can switch back on microphones and cameras for questions. Okay, so I'll hand it over to you. Okay, so I'll share my screen. Can you see that? Stephen? Okay. Yes, I can see it. <clears throat> okay. Um, can um, I just mention, mention one more thing before sure. Jeff starts? <clears throat> if anybody wants to say something during the presentation, use the chat function. Okay. <clears throat> Off you go. Okay, I'll get started then. So this is a bit unusual because I'm not used to doing this without a, a visual audience in front of me, but um, I'll try to give it a go. <clears throat> okay, um, so this is actually some work that I've been wanting to do for a while based on some field work that I did in the early 2000s in collaboration with some other people, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, and something I noticed that um, I haven't had a chance to look at until now. So last year I decided to start looking at this more systematically. <clears throat> and this is the uh, variation in terms of complementizers in Caribbean English. And this is something, if you go back to the early days of Creole studies, um, oh, how can I do this? <clears throat> um, people like uh, Derek Bickerton pointed out that there were different types of complementizers that could be taken. In this context, um, uh, we're talking about finite complementizers, and this is similar to standard English. So if you have a non-finite complement um, of a verb or, or a noun, um, you normally use the, um, the form two. <clears throat> so um, I've, I've standardized the spelling here so it's, it's easier to understand. Farmer and I know what to do. Um, we got to repair, I'm just cutting. But Bickerton also noticed that there are a number of forms based on the English preposition for, variously pronounced as for or fi or fa, um, which fulfill the same function. So here's an exa another example from his uh, data, Hope Town People Dem Na Na Wat Fadu, we got for go back to repair them. <clears throat> and you notice in the final example, you see the um, variation between the for form and the to form. So he called these T complementizers and F complementizers. And um, in his work in Guyana, um, he looked at which of the speakers were using the T forms and which were using the F forms. And uh, this is taken from his 1971 study where he divided speakers into three different classes. So one class was the professional or commercial class. Uh, the other class was people with some degree of education. 
and then the third class was the uneducated class, you can see there's a big difference between the uneducated class C on the one hand and the other classes on the other in terms of their much higher use of the F complementizer. So <clears throat> Bickerton was working in a model of the Creole continuum at that time, which suggested that a uh, Creole undergoes a process of decreolization where it becomes more like the mainstream or standard language, in this case, English. And so what was happening was uh, gradually over time, people were replacing the four, the F complementizer with the T complementizer. Um, this was taken up um, by other work in the 70s um, and people looked in more detail at what uh, the conditioning of this variation was beyond social class and uh, Washaba, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, came up with the idea that it had to do with the nature of the verb in the matrix clause of the complement. <clears throat> and he divided them into what he called inceptive verbs. So this is the plus incept part here. So that would be verbs like start, so start to or start for. Um, what he called desertive verbs, so verbs like want, <clears throat> and then other verbs. And Washaba suggested that what you could do was um, look at the distribution of the T and the F complementizers, and you could place someone on, this, on a linear scale between the most Creole-like and the least Creole-like. And he further argued that there was an implication so that if the speaker would use the, um, the T forms with inceptive verbs, then they were more likely to use it with desertive verbs uh, and then with non-inceptive and non-desertive verbs. And so he came up with a number of different models <clears throat> that showed where speakers might um, fit on this Creole continuum. Now, when I was doing the literature review on this in the Creole literature, I found it kind of strange that this discussion kind of died out in the 70s. So after the 70s, people really didn't pay a lot of attention to this type of variation and its implications for uh, the, the Creole continuum or the post-Creole continuum. Um, if you look at more recent work in Creole studies, there's a, some attention paid to relative clauses in terms of, of uh, complements, but not much else. So this is kind of curious as to why this topic um, fell out of favor. So what I wanted to do was to come back to Creole complementation and ask a couple of questions. So the first question that I wanted to ask is whether or not um, the presence of variation in terms of the choice of complementizer indicates the presence of multiple linguistic systems. So if we're seeing variation uh, among speakers in terms of their choice of complementizer, does that indicate that they're switching between a more Creole-like system and a less Creole-like system? <clears throat> and furthermore, can we then place individual speakers on some kind of a linear continuum? Um, second, I wanted to ask um, how much of the variation is conditioned by the matrix verb. So going back to Washaba's consideration, um, is the choice of what type of complementizer you use dependent on um, which matrix verb uh, is involved? And then furthermore, um, if we look across speakers, so um, uh, even once we've, we've put speakers onto a linear continuum, if we can do that, do they share the same linguistic conditioning? So is the conditioning on the basis of the matrix verb the same? for all of the speakers. <clears throat> I see something flashing here. Is, are people asking me questions? Oh, sorry, yes, okay. Okay, yes, yeah. so just to step back, so now I see these questions. So inceptive verbs have to do with verbs like start, for example. Um, deserter verbs are verbs like um, want, and so on and so forth. Um, and then they try to classify them in various ways. I'm going to be using a more detailed um, classification than that. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about an island in the East Caribbean called Bekwe, which is in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. This is a project um, I started working on in the early 2000s, initially in collaboration with Jack Sidnell, who's an anthropologist who was at Northwestern University in Chicago at the time. He's now at the University of Toronto. Um, and then uh, with Miriam Meyerhoff, who at the time was at the University of Edinburgh, she's now at um, Victoria University of Wellington. 
Um, and Jack has sort of moved on to other projects, but Miriam and I have continued to work on this along with her uh, former PhD student, Ag Agata Dalashenska. Um, so just to give you an idea of where Bekwe is located, so this is the Eastern Caribbean. You can see St. Vincent and the Grenadines, which is close to Barbados. <clears throat> and then it's the island of Bekwe is located just south of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The reason we were interested in this island um, is because uh, for one thing, until fairly recently, it was relatively isolated. So uh, it didn't have an airport until 1992. So the only way you can really get to the island before that was by taking a ferry from Kingstown. And uh, the ferry, well, the modern ferry with a motor takes about an hour through very choppy seas. Um, so it's not a pleasant, I've done that journey a few times myself, so it's not very pleasant. Um, and so uh, the people on this island were relatively isolated. Um, until fairly recently. Um, the other thing that's interesting about this island, as, as we'll see in a moment, is it, despite its small size, it actually features a high degree of ethnic and linguistic uh, variation in terms of the uh, composition of the population and the types of language that they speak. So the island is roughly hook-shaped, um, fairly mountainous. Um, it's about seven square miles in area. Um, if you if it weren't for the mountainous aspect of it, you could probably walk across it in a couple of hours. Um, but it contains a number of different communities. So one community, uh, which is called Hamilton, is across the bay from the main port, which is Port Elizabeth, uh, located here. And Hamilton uh, is primarily populated by the descendants of uh, former African slaves who worked plantations in that area. So up until the, um, well, the island was uninhabited basically until the middle of the 18th century when the uh, British took control of it from the French and then they settled it with um, sugar plantations. Uh, once slavery was abolished in the British Empire in the early 19th century, uh, the economy shifted from sugar and uh, plantations towards subsistence farming. Um, and then on the south side of the island, uh, whaling industry was developed. So the people in Hamilton are descendants of um, former um, African slaves that worked on that plantation. Um, up in the hills behind uh, Port Elizabeth is the uh, community of Mount Pleasant. Uh, they're the descendants of um, British origin um, Caribbeans, uh, mainly who were relocated there from uh, Barbados in the mid to late uh, 19th century. And until fairly recently, they remained fairly isolated from the rest of the population, both geographically, because they're up on a mountain, um, and also socially. Uh, because they perceive themselves as being ethnically different from other people on the island. On the south side of the island, there's a group of contiguous settlements. Um, two of the ones that we're concentrating on here are Paget Farm and La Pompe. And um, the main uh, economy there is based on, again, small-scale subsistence farming, but also um, fishing and whaling. And um, about three-fifths three of the population of the island is actually based on the south side. And it's a much more ethnically uh, mixed population than the other groups. So there's a mixture of um, uh, British background people, African background people, Portuguese background people, and so on and so forth. Um, and so when we first started doing work on the island in 2003, we, the original idea we had was to come in and look at what we thought of as black and white varieties of English spoken on the island. But it quickly became apparent to us when we were talking to people that that's not the way people see themselves there. So they don't see themselves in racial terms. They see themselves more in terms of what village on the island they come from. And people talked about the fact that if you come from Hamilton, you sound a particular way. If you come from Paget Farm, you sound a particular way. Now, obviously, they, don't, they didn't have the vocabulary or the, the um, metalinguistic awareness to say exactly what it was that made things different. But actually, what we found is that people were fairly accurate in terms of placing where someone came from on the island. In previous studies that we've done of both grammatical um, and phonetic features, we found that um, in general, Hamilton tends to be the most Creole-like in terms of its uh, linguistic behavior. Mount Pleasant tends to be the least Creole-like or the most like non-standard English. And that would suggest to us that maybe if we were gonna put people in the, on the island on a uh, Creole continuum, that Hamilton would be at the Creole end and Mount Pleasant would be at the English end. And uh, the communities in, in Southside, like Paget Farm and La Pompe, 
tend to fall somewhere in between these two poles. So this suggests to us that if we're looking at a feature like um, complementizers, then maybe uh, we could look at what people are doing in terms of the choice of complementizer they use when they're speaking and put them on some kind of Creole continuum. So in uh, 2003 to 2005, we did three field trips uh, to the island and we hired local people, mainly um, students who had just finished high school um, and didn't have a job yet, so um, had some time on their hands um, and had them go out and do sociolinguistic interviews with their neighbors and relatives. So people from the, each of these villages then would go to their aunties or their grandfathers or their next door neighbors and sit down with them and engage them in conversation for a couple of hours. And what we ended up with was um, a fairly well-balanced uh, corpus of data uh, between four of these villages, so Hamilton, Mount Pleasant, Paget Farm, and La Pomp. We also collected a few interviews from uh, the town of Lower Bay, which is located on the other side of the bay from Hamilton, uh, mainly because one of our interviewers, um, her mother happened to be from there, and therefore uh, we thought it would be a good opportunity to get some data there. But mainly it's from these four other villages, and we tried to uh, balance it as evenly as possible between males and females. All of these people are between the ages of 40 and 100, at the time of the interview, we were mainly looking at older people who had grown up on the island before the advent of the, um, the tourist industry and before the uh, building of the airport to get an idea of what language would have been like uh, when, when the island was fairly isolated. Um, so you can see that we've, uh, the corpus that we're looking at consists of 62 interviews. They range in length from about um, an hour and a half to, to up to three hours, so a fair amount of speech. For today's presentation, um, I'm just gonna present on a subset of this data. So based on um, 25 of these interviews that have been fully transcribed, so which um, makes it easier to locate the occurrences or the tokens of the things that we're looking for, um, we did an analysis where we went in and exhaustively pulled out every single complement clause and looked at what complementizer was used to introduce it. So um, we divide them into three groups. So one of them has to do with finite complements. So this is um, complements of primarily of verbs that have a finite verb in them. Can you hear that? I, I can't get any feedback from anyone if they can hear this. No, I can't hear. And here? Uh, no, I can't hear. No. Can't hear? Okay. Okay, so okay, with finite complements, we've basically got two variants. So we have a zero variant, so I believe they born here, and we have a that variant, so I have to believe that they say so, but I don't know. So imagine that with a Caribbean accent, not with a Canadian accent. Um, in the second group, Uh, we're looking at non-finite complements. So this is the T and the F forms I was talking about earlier. And here we have one variant, which is the T variant, the two variant. You only want to see her when it's dark. Someone's chatting. Oh, okay, because I'm using earphones maybe? I don't know. Shared screen. Oh, okay, click the box with audio. Let me see. <clears throat> oh, share computer sound. There we go. Your computer sound. No, I have to install some device to do this. Hang on. Can you hear that? No. No? Okay. Forget it's not that important, it's just a question of letting you actually hear the speaker's voices. Anyway, okay. 
So with the finite complements, we have the two variants. With the non-finite complements, we have three variants. So we have the T variant, two. We have the F variant, so four, which is pronounced more like fa. And then we have the zero variant. Uh, for relative clauses, we also have three broad variants. So we have the that variant, so it'd have lots of people that go to church. Uh, we have a WH variant, so if you have children who are not mature enough, and then we have a zero variant, um, there's some girl still does go. Uh, the relative clauses are interesting because some of these forms, like the zero variant with a subject, is very unusual in English and tends to occur in, only in certain dialects of English and um, in Creoles, English-based Creoles. So we end up uh, exhaustively extracting all occurrences and from these 25 interviews, we ended up with a data set of over 9,000 tokens. And so what we want to look at initially is what the distribution of these different variants is across the different villages. So that is, are we seeing differences in terms of um, the use of these different variants in each of the villages? It's okay, I'm not gonna worry about the sound at this point. Okay. Um, okay, if we look first of all at the distribution of the finite complement, you can see that the distribution is pretty much even. There's maybe for the zero forms a slightly higher rate of zero in Hamilton, although Paget Farm comes a close second. Um, for that, um, Mount Pleasant and especially La Pompe have higher rates of that. So there's some indication that there is some difference between villages in terms of their use of the finite complement. For the non-finite complement, um, we see that Hamilton tends to prefer the zero form more than the other villages and the four form more than the other villages. Now, remember that the four form is often associated with the more Creole-like variety. So this might be an indication that we can put Hamilton at the more Creole end of the spectrum. Um, but if we look at the two form, um, we see that the other three villages are patterning together. For relative clauses in subject position, so that's like the example that I showed you earlier, um, we can see surprisingly that Hamilton doesn't have the highest rate of zero in subject rel relative position, it's Paget Farm. Um, and if we look at WH, oddly enough, it's Hamilton that has the highest rate of WH relatives in subject position. So this is kind of unusual because you would expect the more English-like variety, so Mount Pleasant, to have the highest rate of the WH, which is considered the more standard variant. Finally, if we look at non-subject relatives, um, we see that, um, again, um, sorry, uh, with the zero form, um, both Hamilton and Paget Farm have the highest rate of zero. Uh, that is highest in La Pompe and somewhat less high in Mount Pleasant. So it's an interesting question. It looks like in some cases we're seeing some kind of um, coordination with, with a Creole continuum, in other cases not, but it might be complicated by the fact that we're looking at individual speakers who might be doing things for different reasons under different circumstances. So what we wanted to do then is to look maybe holistically at, at the distribution of all of these forms to see if maybe we're getting any kind of clustering of these features together. So maybe it's not the individual things themselves that are contributing to being more Creole-like or less Creole-like, uh, it's, it's a particular constellation of features. So we made use of principal component analysis, which is a way of uh, taking individual occurrences of something um, across different dependent variables and looking at whether they correlate in different ways. And when you do this, what happens is that it gives you loadings in particular factors. So it looks at where you're getting the highest degree of convergence on particular features. And it gives you also a quantitative measurement of the strength of correlation between those forms. So when we did this um, for these different uh, features altogether, so we have the zero finite, the that finite, the zero non-finite, the four non-finite, the two non-finite, zero subject relative, the that subject relative, the WH subject relative, the zero non-subject relative, the that non-subject relative, and WH. What we find is that there are basically four or five factors that decrease in importance. And actually the first two factors here, um, the DIM stands for dimension. So dimension one and dimension two um, show loadings um, that agree in particular ways. So if we look at dimension one, which accounts for 38% of the variation 
in the data across all of these features, um, the strongest loadings are for the zero forms across all four of these contexts. So what that suggests is that the most important consideration for speakers in terms of how they rank with respect to the, all of these different types of complementizer is whether they use the zero form or how much they use the zero form. So the zeros tend to correlate together. The second factor, which accounts for a further 29% of the variation, unites the that's. So the finite that, the subject and non-subject relative that are united for this. So what this suggests is that the zero form is the most important, but then the, the um, convergence in terms of the use of that is next important. And if you're a stats geek and you look at the, the numerical values here, you can see that the strongest values are in the first two dimensions and then the numbers go down as you go to the left, to the right. So what that means is basically that um, these dimensions are having less and less uh, of a responsibility in terms of the variation that we're seeing. The other thing that principal component analysis does for you is for each of these loadings, for each of these dimensions, it gives you a numerical value for each of the individual speakers involved. So what we can then do is look at this uh, convergence in terms of these two features and plot speakers in terms of where they fall in the space that's defined by these two features to see whether or not we're getting some kind of linear or grouping effect happening. So if we plot all of the speakers onto one chart, um, as we do here, so the x-axis is the place of the speaker in dimension one, so they're loading in dimension one, and the y-axis is they're loading in dimension two. And so what each of these points on the graph is, is an individual speaker, and the number is the random number that we assigned to them when we did their interview, so we don't use their real names, we use a, a number to preserve their anonymity, but then we indicate afterwards which um, village they come from. So MP is Mount Pleasant, H is Hamilton, LP is La Pomp, PF is Paget Farm. Now it's kind of hard to see here, but what you can glean to some extent is that the speakers are kind of congregating in similar areas of the graph. So the Hamilton speakers tend to be concentrated more in the lower right-hand corner of the graph. The Mount Pleasant speakers tend to be concentrated more on the left-hand side and maybe a little bit um, towards the top of the graph. So that suggests that perhaps um, the Creole part of the graph is in the lower right-hand corner and the English part of the graph is in the upper left-hand corner, in which case we would expect people from Mount Pleasant and, pa and La Pompe to be located somewhere in between. Well, it's actually a little messier than that. The Paget Farm speakers are, are maybe shifted a little bit more towards where the Hamilton speakers are. With the La Pompe speakers, granted we only have three La Pompe speakers, but um, they're sort of all over the place. So we're not sure how much of this has to do with the fact that we have so few of the speakers right now coded for this feature. Um, but the idea that you can group people on a neat line in terms of less Creole-like or more Creole-like seems not to be supported. Okay, so that was the first question about whether or not we could group people according to whether they're more Creole-like or less Creole-like on the basis of their behavior. What I wanna look at now in more detail is um, the conditioning of finite complements. So the alternation between that and zero. Now, remember I said that earlier people suggested that the uh, matrix verb played an important role in terms of deciding which complementizer uh, was chosen. So what we could look at then was the actual um, matrix verb located in the matrix clause to see if that did in fact have an effect. What's interesting though is that we find that it's actually a fairly small set of matrix verbs that occur in this position that take particular types of complement. Um, so on this pie graph this shows you the distribution of the lexical types of the matrix verb and you can see that three verbs say, think, and know account for 62% of the data. So that is 62% of the occurrences of finite complements have say, think, or know as the matrix verb. And then you have tell and see contributing a further 15%. And then there are 10 lexical types that contribute a further, I forgot what that is, 18%. Um, and then a further 10% by 46 lexical types. So this suggests that even if there is a lexical effect, it may be highly skewed because of the fact that you have such a small set of lexical verbs that are taking complements in the first place. 
I was curious though to see how much of this is specific to Beque. And I went back to a study that Renatoris Kakoulos and I did of the alternation between that and zero in the English spoken in Canada, in Quebec City. And this shows you just a side-by-side -side comparison of the verbs involved with selecting complement clauses. And this kind of freaked me out when I first saw it. So um, think, know, and say are the most popular complement selecting verbs in the Canadian English data as well. Not only that, they have the exact same proportion of the data, 62%. So this suggests that this isn't just something due to uh, Beckway, it may be something due to English in general, maybe a lot of languages in general will take a small set of verbs that take these particular finite complements. And then again, we have this decreasing effect, so larger number of lexical types taking up less and less proportion of the data. So the question might be, maybe it has to do something with the frequency of particular verbs and the extent to which they take that or zero. So what we could do then is plot the frequency of that or zero according to the frequency of the particular le lexical type. So um, this graph plots uh, on the x-axis the number of tokens, tokens, the number of occurrences of each of these uh, matrix verbs in the data, and then the y-axis looks at the percentage of that. So if there is a straightforward, straightforward correlation be between um, the matrix verb, frequency of the matrix verb, and that or zero, we'd expect to see um, a diagonal line running through this, but we don't. In fact, what we find is there's a high degree of variation with the less frequent verbs in terms of how, whether they take that or zero. Um, and for the most frequent verbs, no, think, and say, they actually pretty much behave in the same way. So they tend to have fairly high rates, slightly higher rates of that than the other groups. Now, something that Rana and I found in our earlier study was that it wasn't so much the matrix verb on its own. It had to do with the combination of the matrix verb with particular subjects in the matrix clause. And in particular, if you think about um, matrix clauses like I think or you know, uh, in many ways, these don't act like canonical matrix clauses. They act, in fact, like um, markers, discourse markers or markers of, of um, epistemology. So, you say something like, I think he's coming. Um, the question is, is I think really a matrix clause there or is it some kind of comment on your attitude towards the putative subordinate clause? Um, you can also detach that so you can say he's coming, I think, in which case that's clearly not um, a matrix clause. So what we did then for this data, then I also looked at combinations of matrix clauses, uh, sorry, matrix verbs with particular matrix subjects and looked at um, the extent to which combinations of frequent matrix verbs and subjects correlated to the use of that matrix verb in other, with other types of subject. So this just shows you um, some frequent combinations like I believe, I find, I guess, I hear, I hope, I know, I mean, I remember, I see, I think. Um, you hear, you know, you say, you think. And then looking at other subjects with the same verb. And what I'm interested in here is whether or not the frequency of that um, is the same across these different contexts. And what I hope you can see from this is that for most of these frequent combinations, the uh, frequency of that is quite lower when you have a frequent um, collocation of a particular matrix subject and verb, like I believe or I find. So for example, with I believe, um, you have 14%, other contexts of believe have 27%. For I find 8% versus other uses of find 47%. So what this suggests is that maybe a lot of these um, combinations of matrix subject and verb aren't actually matrix clauses. There's something more like some kind of discourse marker, epistemic marker. So now we've got an idea of what the linguistic conditioning is. Um, what we can do then is look at the uh, combination of linguistic conditioning. So the conditioning by the matrix subject and verb and compare that to the conditioning by the village. So for this, what I'm going to do is, um, first of all, uh, multiple regression analysis. So this looks at the individual contribution of linguistic factors and social factors, and it assigns a weight uh, that the contrib contribution of that factor makes to the selection of that or zero. And what we find when we do this is that um, the best model that it gives us is first of all, it takes into consideration what the individual speaker is doing, so that's important. But then once we put aside the speaker's contribution in terms of their choice, 
we can look first of all at the signif significant effect of the combination of matrix subject and matrix verb, and then the contribution of village. So in terms of the village, we see that the um, law gods, which gives you an indication of the contribution to the use of that, um, is much higher for La Pompe, Paget Farm, and Mount Pleasant than it is for Hamilton. In fact, Hamilton has a negative effect. So what this means is that um, Hamilton users prefer not, Hamilton speakers prefer not to use that in um, finite clauses. And this sort of confirms what we saw in terms of the overall distribution, it's, there's a much lower. The FW means factor weight, so that's just another, another measurement. Log odds is um, centered on zero and ranges from minus infinity to plus infinity. Uh, factor weights are centered on 0.5 and range from zero to one. If we look down at the contribution of the linguistic factor, which is the combination of matrix verb and uh, matrix subject, we see again a confirmation of what we saw in the previous slide. That is that there are certain combinations like I think, you know, I mean, and you hear that are highly disfavoring to the use of that. So again, that suggests that maybe these are functioning less as matrix clauses and more as discourse markers or, or epistemic markers. Now, there are a number of problems with using multiple regression for this analysis, um, one of which is that when you're doing this type of analysis with, with grammatical variables where you get relatively small numbers, um, what you can get is skewing effects that affect the reliability of multiple regression. So uh, what a lot of um, work in the study of variation has been doing lately is to make use of other techniques of analysis, one of which is um, known as recursive partitioning. So instead of testing your data against a particular model, as we're doing here, what you do is you take your data and you divide it according to what factors give you the most significant divisions in terms of your distribution of data. So you take your data and you divide it into two groups. You then look at each of these groups and see if you can make further subdivisions and so on and so on. And so this gives you um, what's known as a conditional inference tree. And so if we do a conditional inference tree for this data, what we see is that, um, as you can see from the first note at the top here, the most important division that's made in partitioning the data is between the matrix sub, uh, the type of matrix, combination of matrix subject and matrix verb. And so you have these frequent matrix subject and matrix verbs type on one side of the tree, and then the other forms on the other. So there's a clear distinction between the, I think I, you hear, you know, and so on, which feature much lower rates of that than the others do. Once you've made that division, within this, these frequent subject-verb combinations, there are no further significant divisions to be made. But on the other side, with the um, other forms, which are actually probably the productive alternations of the that and zero, we find here there's an important distinction in terms of village. So that is, you have La Pomp, Mount Pleasant, and Paget Farm on one side, which with much higher rates of that, and Hamilton on the other with much lower rates of that. So again, this confirms what we saw earlier. So this is just another piece of evidence to support the conclusion we made from the, the multiple regression analysis. So basically the linguistic factor is paramount, which suggests that all of these speakers are basically sharing the same linguistic conditioning. And then village is the secondary factor, which means that maybe the village is not, it's not th that these speakers are differing in terms of the linguistic um, system that they're using, but that there are, are, for whatever reason, are differences in terms of their rate of use of this particular feature. So in conclusion, um, we see that there's a high degree of variation across villages and speakers in terms of their use of complementizers. Uh, and there is a clustering of the variants and each village seems to occupy a certain region of the cluster. But contrary to what people suggested back in the 70s, this doesn't seem to fall along any kind of linear continuum of more Creole-like or less Creole-like. It seems to be more multidimensional. And this is something we've been finding with a lot of the other grammatical and phonetic features that we've been looking at, is it's very difficult to place people along a line, but that there are clear clustering of features that define um, the particular, the different villages. And this sort of supports the intuitions that the speakers had themselves that they were telling us that they could tell where someone on the island comes from. So it's not perhaps an individual feature they're thinking of, it's some kind of constellation of features. We've seen also that the variation in terms of the complementizer, at least in finite clauses, is due to a fairly small set of matrix verbs. 
Um, but contrary to ideas that this has something to do with the frequency of the verb, uh, it seems to have more to do with the frequency of certain combinations of matrix subjects and matrix verbs. And this goes along with what uh, Rana Torres Kakulos and I found in other work um, and seems to be common across not just um, uh, this, these varieties of English, but other varieties of English. And again, it may be something that's, that's more common across languages as well. Um, we've seen from both the multiple regression analysis and the recursive partitioning that the linguistic constraints are more important than the differences between villages. So what this suggests is that rather than saying that speakers are switching between a more Creole-like and a less Creole-like system, probably there's the same, there's one underlying system that's governing the variation across all of the villages. Thank you. So should I stop my screen sharing? I guess so. All right, there's obviously a hand clapping signal that you can add to your, I don't know how to do that, but I'll learn, I suppose. There's a reactions button on the bottom. Right, oh yes, okay. So um, the paper is now open for questions and discussion. Who would like to start? You can unmute before you ask your question. Carolyn, did you have a question? Um. No. No question? Awesome. Well, people are organizing their thoughts. I did have a question It was to do with the, when you went back to the, when you introduced the relative clauses, yeah. whether you considered the issue of restrictive versus non-restrictive relative clauses. We will. Um, so there's, uh, there's three different areas we're looking at, as I said. So there's the finite clauses, the non-finite clauses, and the relative clauses. Um, I've mainly been working on the finite clauses just because I have some experience with looking at these features in other varieties of English. Um, I'm still in the process of trying to wrap my head around the non-finite because there are lots of different systems that people use to classify the different types of or the different functions of non-finite clauses. So that's proving to be a bit more complicated. Um, and then with the relative clauses, um, that's actually something Miriam is working on because she's been doing some work on relative clauses in um, New Zealand English. And she's also going to be going back to her Bislama data and looking at it there to do kind of a trans-Pacific, trans-global comparison. But certainly, yeah, that's something we'll be looking at as a difference between uh, restrictive and non-restrictive. The subject, non-subject thing is fairly important for varieties of English because like that example that I, that I showed you with the, um, the zero subject relative, to me, that's, I couldn't say something like that. Um, so that's something that really jumps out at me. Okay. Next question. You have such a big audience here. <laughs> I thought people would be less shy. <laughs> I'll, I'll ask a question, James, yeah. if, yeah, cool, if my audio is working. Um, just to take a step back from the data specifically, uh, I'm just curious what your experience of working with the local students was like. Experience was it in, in, in terms of, was it in part an engagement or an enrichment program for them, or did they learn any specific skills as part of the process? Oh yeah, I mean, we, um, it was basically sort of a, um, for the first round, it was kind of a summer job thing for them. So they had finished, um, they just finished high school or secondary school, and we got in touch with a, one of our initial contacts was a, a teacher who worked at the secondary school who had a background in folklore and linguistics. Um, so she was very keen, and um, so we trained up the students in terms of the ethical protocols of doing the work, in terms of um, recruiting people, in terms of um, managing the equipment. Um, and uh, we had 
two of them um, I kept in touch with for a number of years afterwards, um, one of whom went on to local politics um, and one went into customer service in St. Vincent um, and also a modeling career. Um, <laughs> so they, uh, they were quite, um, they said they really enjoyed the work and they got some good experience. And also we, I was able to serve as a reference for them a couple, for a couple of jobs after that. So um, they also said the other thing they, they enjoyed was listening to the stories that their neighbors and relatives told them. We've been trying for a number of years to um, negotiate with local authorities about uh, archiving the data because there's a lot of oral history and local history that's recorded in these, these interviews. Um, there, there are problems though around um, confidentiality though, uh, because it's very easy for people to identify someone else. So um, getting the data transcribed is a big challenge because um, if you had heard it, you could hear it's, it's very non-standard. Um, and at, when I was at York University, there were a couple of years where I was quite lucky because I was able to find um, some Vincentian women who were there doing uh, uh, degrees in either applied linguistics or nursing who were able to do a lot of the transcription, but one of them came to me at one point and she said, I think I know this person. <laughs> um, so it's a fairly, it's a fairly small country. It's about 70,000 people. Um, so there are issues around um, confidentiality in terms of that, that mean that it's difficult for us to, to think about how to archive this locally without betraying the, the confidentiality aspect of it. Um. Joshua wanted me to ask a question because his microphone doesn't seem to be working. And his question is, over what kind of period were the recordings taken? And is there any diachronic data worth looking at? So the, these data were done over three years. Um, so we went, I went there twice, uh, Miriam went there twice, uh, Jack went there twice and not all overlapping. And I was there for a few weeks at a time uh, Jack and Miriam were there for up to three months at a time. Um, so it was basically three fieldwork sessions, um, a few months every year. Um, and so um, that's in terms of the time frame. Um, Miriam's student, Agata Dalashenska, went back um, in five or six years later and um, looked at younger speakers. So we have data from uh, the grandchildren and great-grandchildren of these people. Um, and they're quite different. So they have preserved the local way of speaking. A lot of it is because a lot of them go to St. Vincent every day for school. Um, so Agatha has left academia and she recently gave us all of her recordings, most of which haven't been transcribed. So we have diachronic data in the sense that we've got different generations uh, from roughly the same time period but there's just so much of the data that we haven't had a chance to, to look at all of that. We did have a paper that came out in, um, I think it's the Journal of Language Evolution last year, where we did an analysis of past tense marking in the older speakers and the younger speakers where we were able to show the shift in the grammatical system across generations. But that's the only study we've done so far that looks at, at shifts across, across generations. Other questions? James, I have a question. Yep, Jonathan. Um, I remember you saying that um, ethnicity or, or race didn't seem to be something that local people felt was relevant. Um, was that something that was also supported by the data? Or did you, and more generally, did you look at other social factors in the data? Um, it's, there isn't really a clear racial categorization on the island because if you rely on visual clues yeah um, there's a lot of racial mixing that's taken place so like i i could say this person maybe looks more african and that person less african but that's not sort of how they see themselves and in fact in our initial um debriefings with the field workers when they were coming back from the first field season we asked them to classify people and they, they just didn't feel comfortable doing it. And it didn't make, the question didn't make sense to them basically. Mm -hmm. um, so they would say, for example, the, the people from Mount Pleasant are often referred to as Bajans because they ultimately came from Barbados, their ancestors. Um, they're also often referred to as red legs 
which is that's what the um, the poor whites in Barbados were called for obvious reasons because their legs got sunburnt in the Caribbean sun. Um, so we didn't really look in terms of, of race or ethnic background because it's very difficult to classify. Um, there's a family name, which I won't mention, which actually occurs across the entire island, which is not a, it's a, it's an unusual name and it's got a particular origin, which suggests that um, there's been such an extent of intermarriage across the island, despite, you know, elements of geographical and social isolation, that the, there's been a lot of mixing. So we put village in initially just to test people's ideas about um, their intuition that you could tell where on the island someone came from. And this, and we actually didn't expect this to come up as important when we did our first study, but actually the more and more studies we've done, we found that actually it is quite important where someone comes from even above and beyond individual differences between speakers, um, mm. the village really does exert an influence in terms of the way they, they speak. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Any further questions? anyone trying to speak if you are trying to speak but someone to type I hear someone uh, typing but type something <coughs> otherwise um, before we thank James for presenting this um, talk I'd just like to observe that I think things have been very successful today um, if somebody who understands what we have to do to make the sounds work could send an email to me and to James at least about what needs to be done for that to work. Um, that would be very helpful. And if any of you sent invitations to somebody else who wasn't on the original list, can you also send me those names? We're going to have a number of future seminars. So on the 30th of this month, Lauren Gorn will be talking about emoji or emoji as digital gestures. Um, and there may be other seminars that are organized in the near future. And if anybody would like to give a seminar, please um, let, um, let me know. I just want to mention one more thing before we um, thank James. And I have to take this opportunity to um, wish very well my PhD student Esther, who is going to be submitting her PhD on Tuesday. So it's been a tricky business to get it finished in these difficult times, but um, I think we can't announce the submission of it today, but it is going to happen very soon. So with that said, um, I'd like everybody to either clap if you're, you know, got your sound on or use the reaction button um, to thank you. can do the Auslan thing. <laughs> oh, thank yes, you, everyone. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming to this. Thank you. So you'll all hear, um, and I'll add you, Jonathan, to the mailing list. You'll all hear from us um, very soon. Uh, maybe you could just type your current email address in there in case I can't find it quickly. Um, uh, you'll all hear from us very soon about coming seminars. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks, Stephen. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Stephen.